You want to talk about the dark side of the ring? It's quite the episode this week. Yes, the title of the episode, I believe, was Whatever Happened to Doink the Clown, but it was about Matt Bourne, the dark side of the ring last week, and in the words of Gorilla Monsoon, what a piece of work. And here that you and I were talking uh, before the show aired, the only time that our my path ever crossed with Matt Bournes was, did we figure out two television tapings when I entered the WWF in 1993 with the Heavenly Bodies? He was there like that taping and the next taping uh, before he got fired as Doink the Clown. And, and SummerSlam. Uh, well, yeah, well, but that that's what I'm... the. We went in one taping ahead of the SummerSlam set of tapings. So he worked with me, those tapings we did. And then that was back in the days we did once a month. So you do the pay-per-view on Sunday and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And so it was the two sets of tapings is what I'm trying to say. Don't complicate things, Brian. You know, I'm not right. <laughs> and Bob Eaton, you say it all the time. I'd, I'd cross him up with something. He'd say, Corny, <laughs> don't do that to me. You know, I'm not right. Call but about anyway, a plane ride. Talking about a plane ride now, but the only time that I was ever around a guy, and then I don't remember, I'm sure we said hello, you know, at, at some point passed in the hall, but we had no interaction. We we had just got there doing a completely different thing. He was doink. And that's the first time I heard the famous De Clown is Down story when they were debuting the the doink gimmick originally they didn't know the clown was going to be evil remember he came out and just entertained kids and didn't do anything off kilter you saw him in the stands yeah he's just in the stands and what the fuck is that clown doing up there well they're in philadelphia one night and they're having one it's one of those five hour long my god nobody's learned in 40 years the tv tapings the wwf used to do with squash matches and blah 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 and they've got a production delay on top of that, and they send the clown out to do his thing in the stands while they're trying to get their tape re-racked or whatever. And the people were so fucking disgruntled and surly in his Philadelphia anyway. They they got they mobbed Doink and took him down, knocked him, pushed him down while he was trying to you know walk up the stairs in the general admission seats or whatever. And Tony Gurria's on the headset at the gorilla position. He in his, his accent. No, it was Rene Goulet. It was Rene Goulet with his French accent. And he was reporting to the truck, De Clown is down. De Clown is down. But anyway, apparently this clown was down for most of his life. And I'd heard the stories of what he had the various trouble he'd gotten into in different territories when he would get, because when we went to mid South, they were still talking about Matt Bourne getting them sued and, you know, getting fired from mid South. And then when we went to, uh, well, when I went to, uh, Georgia in the summer of 83 with the guys from Tennessee to do the local shows that were booked by Bill Dundee, we've told those stories. Yeah. Georgia. That's, I've heard of Georgia. Yeah. I wonder why they didn't mention Georgia at all in the Matt Bourne thing. I've heard well, there, of... there wasn't time. <laughs> there, there was his fucking rap sheet was going over. The, he was out of mainstream wrestling halfway through this program and still getting arrested and shit. So they just, they, they didn't have time. But when we got there, that's where the road warriors had just been brought down and just debuted on Atlanta TV because the original heel team that Ole was going to go with was Arn Anderson and Matt Bourne and Matt Bourne got in trouble and you know had to leave the territory quickly and so he had to bring in the Road Warriors just go hey Eddie Sharkey you got anybody I got nobody I mean, that's a big thing to leave out though the trouble Matt Bourne got into which I always heard was with a young girl but I don't know well that's what I was hearing about two months after it supposedly happened the trouble he got into led to the creation of the Road Warriors. Yes. I mean, that's a pretty significant role in history. I mean, that kind of thing has to be mentioned, I think. There's well, no and, Legion of Doom. There's no Road Warriors without Matt Bourne being a derelict. And I forgot that some people may not have known that also, to be honest with you, because it was just so known at the time. 
but uh, you know that's they had they had good talking heads on this one in terms of again the daughter of one of these talents ends up being the most sympathetic person and Mick Foley was on because he spent time in Texas with Matt Bourne um Dr. Tom Pritchard is always good on these. He's got a good way of analyzing people in the wrestling business. He's fantastic on these. Yeah. And because he's seen all these guys and make all these mistakes and made some of them himself, and he can speak from experience. And he's, he's honest. A great coach. Yeah, and he's honest. He, it's because he's honest, and he also understands the complexities of the kind of people that are in wrestling, but he understands the reality of everyday society. He's great in these. And he's the best coach in wrestling because he's honest. That's why he doesn't have a mainstream job because he's honest. But anyway, and Hacksaw Duggan. So we got that um, Duggan, DiBiase, and Matt Bourne as the Rat Pack in Louisiana were pretty much the, would you say, the, the, the best heel faction in between the Freebirds and the, and the Midnight coming in in terms of you know, Mid South's talent roster. I think at that eighty two, eighty three period. I mean, D Duggan was green. Bourne could work his ass off, and DiBiase was DiBiase. But Duggan had the muscle. He was like the the Gordy of that group at that time. Well, the thing is, there weren't a lot of factions. This is right when you start getting factions. Right when you know, all of a sudden, Continental starts doing things a little bit after this period of time. And the Freebirds, of course, have been out there. Well, then the Freebirds were a three-man team. The Rat Pack was three individuals. The Midnight and I were a tag team and manager, but it was three people together on the heel side that that were also, you know, could hold their own in the ring. You know, and remember, Matt Bourne was never in Mid-South, and then at the end of 82, they do the big episode where the gorilla in the crowd interferes in the match where JYD loses and has to leave town. The tag team is Ted DiBiase and Matt Bourne. That was Matt Bourne's debut. He was replacing Jim Duggan, who no one knew where he was. And of course, he was a gorilla interfering. And that was the formation <laughs> of the Rat Pack right there. He was really good. I mean, that's the thing. You see the things he's doing in the ring. He was good, but he was also spectacular. That it later became the whoopee cushion. The bombs away. Yeah. Looked incredible. And I know his dad did it, but that's one thing he was able to do always. And it always looked good. But the Rat Pack had a relatively short run, and Duggan came into his own very quickly. Matt Bourne was good, but he was almost like the third. He was almost like the Buddy Roberts, but without the on-screen personality of Buddy Roberts. <laughs> well, and and that's the thing with with Bourne. He was a great worker, but as as this episode, you know, illustrated, he was his own worst enemy, and you couldn't really you know, build anything around him or trust him because he was so erratic. And I don't know how he managed to work Mid-South as a heel without going to prison with that, you know, anger management issue and then being that, you know, fucking over the top. Because again, the reason why, you heard Duggan tell the story, the reason why that Bourne got fired was the guy hit Duggan. Duggan hit him back. And when Duggan hit somebody, they were immediately went down. But then Bourne had to fucking kick the guy's face in, uh, you know, while he was already down. And that's what got the lawsuit, right? And the cops were already, you know, trying to get the guy at that point. But I don't think he, I don't think he kicked his eyeball out, as the story indicated. But what he did was, same thing Stan Lane did to that guy in Beckley. He fractured his orbital socket and they they like measure the the millimeters or centimeters one of those things that your eyeball is displaced whether it's too far back or far out or whatever the case but still that's not a pleasant thing to go through but how born could be in that environment with that personality and not go to prison is amazing to me or or get in trouble even worse than he did because think of the, the fan interaction in that territory we've talked about. But not only that, he's going out to bars. He's going out drinking. In that territory, if you were on television, on Mid-South TV, 
everybody knew who you were. And when, you know, guys went out, especially the heels, they had trouble more often than not. And that's why a lot of those guys wanted to go out just to prove that, you know, they were who they said they were. But in the territory at the same time, you had Jim Duggan, who played pro football as six foot three, 280. And all these guys are young, not the guys you saw on TV or you see now at the Legends Fan Fest. They're in their fucking 20s and they're on steroids. And, and it's the 80s, so everybody thinks they have to do cocaine. And Butch Reed, it played football, was a badass. Barry Darso bounced at the same place the Road Warriors did with six feet fucking three and 300 pounds. Hercules Hernandez that I've saw, witnessed, hospitalize a guy with an open-handed slap. And Dr. Death Steve Williams, for fuck's sake. And Nikolai Volkov, even though he was older, he was 6'3 and 320 and, and was a pro boxer at one point. And Jim Neidhart, the fucking anvil. All those guys in that in the dressing room at the same time. And the fans are attacking them. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's why we almost got killed. <laughs> but no, it was not uncommon to for fans or wrestlers to come back from the fucking ring after matches, black eyes, bloody lips, butt head busted open. Is sometimes the fans got more juice at the shows than the wrestlers did because the cops had the nightsticks. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 go ahead. Yeah, nothing about the Georgia stuff, which I think is important because A, he gets in trouble with a young girl, allegedly, as far as I know, and the Road Warriors creation. Not much about the stuff in Portland with him and Buddy Rose. Buddy Rose married his sister. And wasn't there like a real life series of yes. incidents? Well, they covered that. In the buddy story, didn't they? I remember seeing whatever the case, but yes, uh, Bourne was going to kill Buddy Rose at one point for marrying his sister for real to further a fucking wrestling angle. I'm not even sure. I don't know whether the girl was in on it or whether she thought that they were really going to spend their life together full of happiness. But anyway, I don't believe the Brian Blair story of biting Bourne's lip off. I know Brian Blair was a, a very high-level amateur wrestler, but I think if Bourne was a jacked up on many as many drugs as he said he was and had three tries at him, and uh, and and Blair had bit his lip off, that we would have heard more about that. Don't you think? I will say, I've heard Brian Blair tell this story before, and I could be wrong, and I'm not thinking of a specific name. I think I've heard from someone, I think it was someone who was in the bar, one of the boys who confirmed it. Really? At least the severity of the fight, the lip spitting thing, I would have to double check. <laughs> yeah, okay. But it's then, you know, like, that okay, Brian Blair kicked the shit out of Matt Bourne has never been in dispute. We know that Mario Galento hit the ring on Jerry Jarrett. We don't know for sure that Jerry actually pulled his eyeball out and stomped on it on the mat. So we, we do know that Brian Blair kicked the shit out of Matt Bourne, but we're not sure about biting the lip off and spitting it out. Right. Okay. Anyway, basically, this this was not really a a wrestling documentary. It was a documentary about this prick that happened to be a wrestler for some period of, of time and was a second-generation wrestler, obviously. Tough Tony Bourne, who was a Northwest legend, was his dad. But he worked the territories, got fired from most of them, had several ex-wives. I'm not sure that either of them were particularly sympathetic. One of them said, the, uh, I married him because I loved him. All of his other wives married him for his money. What money? The fuck? We're not talking about goddamn, you know, fucking Mark Cuban here, are we? But anyway, beside, like I said, besides the daughter, the, the, they had a couple of the ex-wives. Uh, one of them said that Matt Bourne went out the night before she gave birth and never came home, and he showed up drunk when the baby was born. And they got to the the doink the clown gimmick, and again, briefly on that, because he, he made the gimmick, but he lost the job because he was on drugs, his wife left him, he kept disappearing, he got abusive, he, he stayed up eight days straight doing cocaine, whatever. <laughs> and, and the thing is, 
except for the fact that the clown wasn't as entertaining as he was before. The fans really didn't know when Steve Kern stepped in for a minute just because they fired him on uh, fired uh, uh, Born on short notice. But then they got Ray Apollo, who actually Steve Kern I think could have give a shit about being Doink the Clown, but he did it because they were paying him. But Apollo actually worked on it and worked hard at it. But most people did not know outside the limited amount of smart fans at the time, did they? Or am I overstating that? Smart fans knew. The casual fan didn't know. I never, you know, I was going to arena shows still in like 90. I was going when they changed doinks and I never heard any fans complain. That's a different doink. Hey, there, that's a bait and switch. We want the good doink. It's amazing. Uh. You know, if you go back to the earlier stuff, gets fired in 83 from Mid-South. Gets fired in 83 from Georgia. Actually, same year. For the reasons he got fired, it's amazing he ended up going to work for Vince and ended up on WrestleMania. Of all the guys they could have used on that card, they had so many guys not on WrestleMania. Yeah. They picked Matt Bourne to lose to Ricky Steamboat. And I wonder, you know, at, at that point, you know what, George Scott, Tony Bourne, same era, maybe it was a favor. Because Vince was, that early in the expansion, he had grabbed so many guys, he didn't know half who those people were. And he was relying on, as he usually, as he still does, and as he usually has, you know, his, whoever he was listening to, to recommend people. So, I guarantee you, he'd probably never heard that Matt Bourne existed until somebody brought him up and probably didn't do too much checking. They mentioned ECW. I will say that is one of the great missed opportunities because in 94, he showed up as Doink and he became Bourne again with half his face painted and looked crazy, had his real hair out. And it was nuts. And his promos were crazy, but good. And it was Heyman. And Heyman was getting ready to really go nuts with ECW. He couldn't even last there. That locker room was <laughs> completely insane. He couldn't last there. He was gone. If he lasted two tapings, maybe, but it was a fascinating character, what that could have been. Well, and uh, he they went over some of his other arrests. He was in a bar with his second ex-wife and her ex-boyfriend, she said, spit on her for some reason. That was the quote. So this guy just apparently walks up and just spits on his woman. She had apparently made a big impression on him. And Bourne gets arrested for chasing him outside and lifting the guy's car. Yeah. Um, he put his, uh, does that same ex-wife in the hospital, beat her up and put her in the hospital and went to jail for it. And the next day she said he didn't remember doing it, so she forgave him. Again, the, there was, all the sympathy fell squarely on the daughter in this episode. And finally, she left with her kids. And then they talked about the, the match with Duggan that I, I had forgotten about until, because it was 2010, I guess. And I'd forgotten about it until somebody a couple of years ago had a clip on Twitter. And it, it, it was not like this knockdown, drag out fight. It was just, again, Matt Bourne being a dick because apparently Jim Duggan didn't want to, you know, do chairs and two befores in front of a hundred people at some spot show because I'd never heard Duggan's explanation of it, but he said that Bourne came up and said, Hey, I'll hit you with a chair and you hit me with a two before and he's like, brother, there's a hundred people here. And even then Duggan was a cancer survivor. And this wasn't 1983, it was 2010. He said, look, I'll salute the flag and got to promo. And, you know, and we'll do our thing. And so as soon as they get started, Bourne's not cooperating, tried to hit him in the balls for a shoot. And they just have a goddamn argument in the ring. And Duggan's like, you want to work or shoot? And Bourne goes out and gets a chair, so Duggan gets his two before and tells the referee, and I love this line, Brian. He's, he tells the referee, he said, tell him we'll finish it in the back like we're supposed to. <laughs> if Bill Watts was in charge, I guess. 
Yes, but and then Bourne leaves through the front door and gets in his car and drives off without ever coming to the back. Like he's supposed to. Like he's supposed to. And Mick Foley was laughing about this is so true. He's dying laughing about how you would have to try as hard as possible to dislike Jim Duggan. Nobody dislikes Jim Duggan. But yet this fucking clown, clown, legitimately wants to fucking shoot with him when they're in their fucking 50s over something that had happened 30 years before that. But okay, then tell me, Brian, you're a savant. You, your wrestling history. Who the fuck was Nurse Cratchit? Do you did you even remember a Nurse Cratchit in Memphis wrestling? I do because I remember some of the oddball characters she managed. Doctor Death, <laughs> not Steve Williams. Not Steve Williams, but Doctor Death managed by. He's a doctor by Nurse Cratchit, not Nurse Ugh. Ratchet, but Nurse Cratchit. So this then becomes another country heard from, as they say, the last girlfriend of Matt Bourne, Connie Cook, who apparently had been for a brief period, a brief, a brief period of time, Nurse Cratchit in Memphis, and who currently looks for all the world like a fucking frog is wearing a blonde wig instead of the princess kissing the prince and turning into a frog or whatever the fuck some evolution has gone backwards with this woman wherever that kiss it's supposed to turn the frog into what are you what are you talking about with the frogs the frog and the prince it is that the prince kisses the frog and the frog turns into a princess or is the princess kisses the prince and the prince or the frog and the frog turns into a prince? God damn, now you got me confused. I thought it was See? a princess kisses the frog and he turns into a prince. There you go. Well, some way or another, a prince kissed this fucking woman and she turned into a frog. That's not how that goes. Wait, you just well, it, it, that's the story. what I'm saying. It, they changed it just for this woman. Because <laughs> she's sitting there with her frog fucking face. <laughs> And her goddamn story is, well, I met him when I was in wrestling nurse and she couldn't even pronounce the name. She said, I was nurse Cratchert. I hit people with my bedpan. And she <laughs> said he was crazy and I was crazy. So we hit it off. So apparently he's got, he's a fucking drug addled jobless bum. And he finds this frog on Facebook and he becomes her prince and they get together long enough for her to be suspected of murdering him. I would have to go back and check, but I don't, and I could be wrong. I could be very, very wrong. I don't remember him in the USWA when she was there. Would it have been during the Dallas, uh, tennis, the, the Dallas and world-class and USWA crossover period? Because he spent a lot of time in Texas when he was out of mainstream wrestling. I have to go back and check, but I do love the fact that it happened on Facebook. Like, hey, it's me. It's Matt Bourne. How you doing? You have a place to live? Yeah, how you doing? <laughs> have you got a house? Are you still a nurse? Are you still a nurse? Can you write prescriptions? I'll be there. You have good benefits, don't you? <laughs> so, apparently... Not only do his daughter and one of his exes think that she killed him, but he also allegedly told her his ex, if anything happens to me, well, it's Connie, she killed me, basically. And Connie, old nurse Ratchet, thinks that Matt Bourne took her dying mother's drugs because she was apparently on hospice, her dying mother. Well, the, so here's this drunken drug addict and this fucking frog who knows what she's on you can get warts from that shit and this frog's dying cancer-ridden mother in hospice with drugs in the house what a fucking family circle that was and people found matt born out in the yard on the ground and steered him back into their home where she put him to bed and he was snoring and or gurgling all night, so she thought he was okay. But then 
when she got up about 6.30 in the morning and saw him gurgling and foaming at the mouth, she called it. Obviously, Brian, what's the first thing you do when somebody that you suspect of taking cancer strength medication uh, is now gurgling and foaming at the mouth? You've got to call your best friend in Tennessee to get some advice, right? You'd call me, wouldn't you? You're not in Tennessee anymore. Well, but I've, I've, I mean, same thing, New Jersey to Kentucky. This was fucking Texas to Tennessee or wherever. Yeah. Okay. I'll call you. Call me. I'll give you the straight scoop. Well, apparently the friend that she called said, yeah, it sounds like he's dying to me. So she says that she hung up and called 911. But there's this pesky problem that all the 911 calls are time stamped. And while she claims, and, and this is not disputed in the episode, that she talked to this friend who said, yeah, he's fucking dying. At 6.30 in the morning, she called 911 all around about to crack at 9 a.m. But she said, no, I didn't go back to bed. I did not do that. I called right away. Yeah, but the timestamp on the thing, you talk to 6.30, yeah, and it... So he overdosed and also had a giant enlarged heart. And apparently if Connie didn't kill him, she certainly didn't go out of her way in any respect to prevent his imminent demise. I want to talk about crazy tag teams. How about in World Class in 86, Buzz Sawyer and Matt Bourne? Oh, Jesus Christ. And again, it, it, you could actually, you could put pretty much put Buzz Sawyer's head on Matt Bourne's body or vice versa and almost have the same person. So anyway, I think except for the daughter, all of these people deserved each other. And Mick Foley actually did a nice eulogy at the end for a guy that was such a dick, but it was good to see that the daughter has done well for herself and she's an accountant now or something. And yeah, that's exactly what she is. She's a CPA. She's an yes. accountant. CPA. Well, there you go. Seems like she has her shit together. Good for her. Mick Foley could say anything. He just smiles. Yeah, Mick, Mick can find something good to say <laughs> about anybody. He can find the the one brief little moment when a disreputable, repugnant human being actually exhibited some kind of human qualities, and he'll focus on that. He's a very wonderful, wonderful person, Mick Foley. But that was Matt Bourne. Final thoughts on Matt Bourne. Again, I think there were things left out of the documentary that needed to be there. There was no reason not to have him there. We didn't need a reenactment of the Brian Blair fight thing, and we didn't need a multiple. How many times did we see the eyeball pop out of that guy's head? It well, it was a, it was a bumper times. going to the break. You, you don't you don't want you don't want to leave the television when you know there's going to be eyeballs popping and flying. Eh, I don't know. That's not a proven thing. But um, beyond hey, you that... You know, if, if Nielsen starts to measure that, then I, I'm going to put $50 on it that if you see a tease of an eyeball being popped out of a fucking head before the commercial break, you'll hang around to see what happens. Well, Game of Thrones didn't have commercials, so I don't know. But in terms of Matt Bourne, crazy fucking guy really good as a wrestler i mean there's something to be yeah. said for that there was a for a long time the crazy human beings that you wouldn't want to deal with in the everyday world were great professional wrestlers but too crazy for even wrestling couldn't hold the job anywhere even at home and um you know doing that he couldn't was, hold a job at home you might want to work on that one i mean like in portland you know he couldn't even oh, hold I, a job I thought you meant, well he couldn't hold a fucking home at home though you know doing the clown for something that was something that should have been awful in an era where people who hated WWF pointed to it and talked about it being a circus, they created a clown. And like you said, it wasn't evil right away. He was great in that role. He played that role perfectly. He made it work. And then he could actually wrestle in the ring. I mean, you go watch Raw from the first six months of 93. He was tremendous. Oh, yeah. Him and Randy Savage. I think he did something with him and Janetti. There were just these great matches because Matt Bourne was fantastic in the ring. And that run, which again would have kept going, ended for him less than a year after it started. 
Well, and it's funny because they did reveal that Road Warrior Hawk was the one that named it because he looked so much like Krusty the Clown after a match when he was just all disheveled and whatever. Um, and because of his impact on the Road Warriors actually being a team to begin with. So he, well, he didn't name him necessarily, but he, he called it. He said, yeah, he looks like Krusty the Clown. We got our own Krusty right here. If all the things that Matt Borden got in trouble with, everything that happened in his life happened 20, 25 years later, would he even be able to get a job in wrestling? You know, the oh, fact good that, Lord. The no. fact that he got to work for the WWF in 85 is one thing, because they were still just hiring everyone, and the world was what it was. But even to go back after Big Josh in 92 to be doink, would that have happened 10 years later, 15 years later, or now? No, because, again, not only did most fans not know what happened in any other territory or when, it, you know, remember when they brought Art Bar to WCW? Yeah. Um, that was 19, what, 90? It was only the, the smart fan, the limited pool of smart fans at that time that knew anything about it that brought it to the attention of WCW and Jim Hurd cost him his job there. And that was not, it wasn't that it, when confronted with the news, Hey, this guy abuses his wife or he's been convicted of doing something with an underage person or whatever. It wasn't that it was ignored completely as that it wasn't known. There wasn't the internet. There wasn't unless literally the wrestling fans were sending each other clippings out of the newspaper from Monroe, Louisiana to wherever the fuck. And the same thing with Vince, like you said, not only is he hiring all these guys from all these territories that are in the business, he didn't, he didn't see any more of them years ago than we've talked about. He saw in modern times, he went by, you know, uh, Pat Patterson or George Scott or Jim Ross or whoever is booking or creative staff was at the time recommendations. And a lot of times you didn't know what, there was no background checks because they weren't in those in the eighties. They weren't signing long-term contracts with every Tom, Dick and Harry, but also there was no database to go by. So, you know, and there was no um, there was no way that any wrestling fans were going to know widespread background information on people's criminal records or whatever. Hey, so listen, it was a whole different time. Jimmy Snuka murdered his girlfriend in '83 in the middle of his run, and it well, kept and, going. and that now that one Vince definitely knew what was going on there. But in that case, it was his biggest star. But I'm talking about in terms of fans and fan knowledge of things and fans caring about things. Cause there were some fans who knew cause things got into the newspaper. Apparently there were fans briefly chanting murderer at him. Yeah. But only in the Northeast and only at a couple of TV tapings. And then nobody, nobody really got it. But Snooker was fired for flaming out on drugs, not for that stuff. And then he was brought back in 89 and then he made guest appearances all throughout time until a scandal, until, until a scandal, until, it got reinvestigated what happened in 83. Oh, yeah. but Because, because Snuka was Snuka and Matt Bourne was Matt Bourne. If Matt Bourne had gotten over to the level of Jimmy Snuka before all that shit came out, it would have been a different story. He, but he, he got, he, all of Bourne's shortcomings came to light either while he was working there or, you know, whatever, before he ever really got over to the point that they couldn't do without him. He never, he never got a chance to get established before he got fired for something. Well, there it is. Another talented yet <laughs> unemployable crazy person from the world of wrestling. Matt and speaking, speaking of people who got established before they could get fired for doing shit, this coming week, it's the Junkyard Dog on Dark Side of the Ring, Vice TV, Tuesday nights at 10 Eastern. So at that point, Dog could have gotten away with almost anything except the one thing that he did do which was take off and leave with no notice 